coming up next on Bear News, both presidential candidates are pushing hard to win votes in Colorado. We have the latest on both campaigns. Coming, coming up in sports, records are set in Nottingham Field this past weekend. They're in favor of the Bears. I'll tell you more coming up next in sports. And tonight we've got some more snow on the way. I'll let you know when in weather. We've got all that and more on this episode of Bear News. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us today on Bear News. I'm Megan Pressler. And I'm Jamie Arterburn. With Election Day almost here, both candidates have been campaigning hard, trying to get the votes of both President Barack Obama and Governor Mitt Romney need for a win. Bear News reporter Ben Warwick is at Red Rocks Amphitheater, where Romney and running mate Paul Ryan take a stop the, take a stop the day after the final debate. That's right. Uh, political big guns were at it again today in Colorado, except this time it was the GOP's turn. One day after his crucial final debate with President Barack Obama, Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney and his vice presidential pick Paul Ryan were in town to mark the start of early voting in what many analysts have called the most crucial swing state of the 2012 presidential election. It was a star-studded event as the candidates appeared in front of nearly 10,000 people on Tuesday. Rodney Atkins, Kid Rock, Colorado Rockies first baseman Todd Helton, and New Mexico Governor Susana Martinez all showed up, but the headliners, of course, stole the show. Hey, Colorado. Are you ready to help us win this thing? They champion their plan for what they call a real recovery from an administration that's become okay with the status quo, and they outline their plan for a specific five-point plan to economic greatness. But number one, we're going to get North American energy independence within eight years. Number two, we're going to take advantage of trade. We're going to make trade work for us. It's good for us to trade with other nations. That creates jobs for us. We're going to make sure our training programs help people get the skills they need. We're going to make sure our schools are world class again. Number four, we are going to balance the budget because we, we, we're not going to have people come invest and start enterprises here unless they see that we're not on the road to Greece. And number five, we're going to champion small business. Paul Ryan and I will not raise taxes on small business. We'll lower them and we'll lower taxes on the middle class in America. The candidates harped on how recent presidential debates have supercharged the campaign and have put it on what they call a surefire path to victory. They have supercharged our campaign, I've got to tell you that. And you know, we're on the home stretch now, and uh, I think the people of Colorado are going to get us all the way there. What do you think? What we also witnessed was a president who's out of ideas. We witnessed a president who really has no record to run on. What we witnessed is a president who is simply offering more of the same. And you know what, Colorado? We can't afford four more years like these last four years. Before he introduced Governor Romney, Congressman Ryan got the crowd fired up by saying that when elected, their plan is not to transform the country. Instead, it's to reclaim what they call four wasted years. And we are not going to try to transform this country into something it was never intended to be. We are going to reclaim and reapply those founding principles that made us great that our veterans right here fought for. This is what we're going to do. That's right, Colorado's not done in the political arena for this race. We've still got two more, ad, two more weeks, rather, of ads, visits, and who knows what else. Reporting from Red Rocks in Morrison, I'm Ben Warwick, Bear News. Thanks, Ben. President Obama was in Denver yesterday, but don't be surprised if that's not the last we see of either candidate. The election is 11 days away, and each major political candidate is making one last stop in key swing states. Vice President Joe Biden stops in Greeley, and Bear News reporter Ben Warwick is out there. Ben, what does he have to say? I'm here at Island Grove Regional Park in North Greeley, where Vice President Joe Biden just spoke to a group of about 1,000, now fresh off of his debate with Vice Presidential Candidate uh, Paul Ryan and President Barack Obama's debate with Mitt Romney. He hit many key points, three of which were women's rights, middle class and job creation, and the expanded federal aid and Pell Grants. After standing in the cold for hours, the Greeley crowd gave the vice president a warm reception, and he responded by giving the crowd of mostly college students exactly what they wanted to hear. 
600,000 of those high-tech manufacturing jobs already exist. They're just looking for skilled personnel. Cut the growth of tuition in half and expand the student aid so more kids can afford to get to college. Colorado's own Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar, introduced the Vice President and spoke on the importance of green energy and agriculture, especially to the residents of the state's Eastern Plains region. And we know when you look at the farmers and the ranchers here in Weld County and across Eastern Plains, that they're doing better than they have in many, many decades, and it's because of the leadership of this President and this Vice President. We also know that for rural America, that securing the nation's energy future is something that we have got to do and we're capturing the power, yes, of oil and natural gas as we're doing Weld County, but also we need to capture the power of the sun and the power of the wind and the power of geothermal. This administration has doubled renewable energy in just four years for the United States of America. Another thing he talked about was the shortfalls of the Romney-Ryan tax plan, calling them decent men, but fundamentally wrong. They're, they're good, decent men, but they have such a fundamentally different view of the country than we do. We have a very different way forward. We have a plan. First, on taxes. We already cut taxes for the middle class by $3,600. We've cut tax more than a dozen times for small businesses. We're going to keep insisting on keeping the tuition tax credit, continuing the child care tax credit for working families. And we're going to make permanent the middle class tax cut. Vice President Biden ended his speech by saying that the Romney-Ryan plan is going back to the future of failed policies and that it's never a good bet to bet against America. From Island Grove Regional Park in North Greeley, I'm Ben Warwick, Bear News. Thanks, Ben. Be sure to tune in to Bear News Facebook page for the latest on Decision 2012 and watch Channel 98 and our YouTube channel for election results on election night. Colorado voters will decide the fate of three statewide ballot measures and local voters will decide whether to issue bonds to help build a new middle school. All three of the statewide initiatives on this year's ballot would amend the Colorado Constitution. Amendment 64 would legalize the possession of limited amounts of marijuana by persons who are at least 21 in the state. It would also allow governments to to license and regulate cultivation and other facilities. It will also require the General Assembly to impose an excise tax on wholesale sales of marijuana and dedicated the first $40 million raised to building public schools. Amendment 65 would instruct members of Colorado's congressional delegation to both purpose and vote in favor of an amendment to the U.S. Constitution limiting political campaign contributions and expeditures. The amendment would also require Colorado's legislator to vote to ratify such an amendment if it ever had the opportunity to do so. Amendments would increase the number of state employees who would be exempt from the state civil service system. It would also change testing the, and hiring procedures in the state personnel system, expand hiring pre preferences for veterans, and make adjustments in the state personnel board. In Greeley and Evans, voters will decide whether to authorize $8.2 million in general obligation bonds to help pay for a new middle school to replace the aging John Evans Middle School. The money would provide the local matching funds for a state grant of $21 million to finance the total $29 million school. The ballot measure would increase tax paid by Weld County District property owners by $845,000 a year. While all eyes are focused on the presidential race, Colorado presidents will also elect seven members of the U.S. House of Representatives. Weld County voters will help decide whether incumbent Republican Cory Gardner will serve for another term as 4th District Representative. His Democratic op opponent is Colorado State Senate President Brandon Schaefer. In other House races, incumbent Do Democrat Diane DeGette faces off against Republican Denver businessman Danny Strode in the 1st District. In the 2nd District, Incumbent Democrat Jared Polis is up for re-election against his Republican challenger, State Senator Kevin Lundberg. Third District Republican Congressman Scott Tipton is running for another term against Democratic State Representative Sal Pace and five other challengers. In the 5th Congressional District, incumbent Republican Doug Lamborn faces Democratic challenger, though three minor party candidates are running against him. Republican 6th District Congressman Mike Kaufman is running against for re-election against Democratic State Representative Joe McLosey. And in the 7th District, incumbent Democratic Ed per Perlmutter faces a challenge from Republican businessman Joe Kors Jr. 
In addition to House of Representatives races, Weld County voters will also decide many other races. Republican P Pamela Mazanek is running against Libertarian Stephen Dillinger for a seat on the State Board of Education from District 4. Democratic Stephen Lundwerk is running from another term as an at-large member of the CU Board of Regents. He faces three challengers, including Republican Brian Davidson, 20 members of the State Senate are also up for election. Though none are from Weld County, all 65 House seats are up for election, including two from Weld County. In District 48, Republican Stephen Humphrey battles Libertarian John Gibson. And in District 50, Democrat Dave Young is running against Republican Skip Taylor. 19th Judicial District Attorney Ken Buck is running unopposed for another four-year term. Also in the judicial realm, Colorado Supreme Court Justin, Ju Justice Nathan Coates is seeking to be retained for another 10-year term on the court. Six members of the Colorado Court of Appeals are also for retention vote. In the 19th Judicial District, four district court judges face retention vote. They are James Hartman, Elizabeth Beckers, Todd Taylor, and Dismore Tuttle. Almost all the leaves have fallen off the trees. Does this mean that snow is on its way? Fair News meteorologist Paul Ford has your first look at weather. Paul? Well, Jamie, right now it's about 60, it's about 32 degrees right now. We're at right about freezing right now, but nothing to worry about right there. Snow totals for last night. We're going to get to the snow tonight in a little bit, but for now we're going to look at tomorrow. Greeley actually got about 3.1 inches of snow. You wouldn't be able to tell right now because it's pretty much all melted away. But it was pretty wet snow, so it was pretty easy to get away. Littleton right now got about 3 inches of snow. And um, Evergreen at about 4.3 inches of snow. And Boulder at 4.5 inches of snow. Tonight, later in the forecast, we're going to check, check out that snow tonight. Also, we're going to have a football forecast for the UNC Bears. And we're going to take a look at your Halloween forecast. Back to you guys. Coming up after the break, we have a preview of the newest scary movie. Stay tuned to Bear News. We are back in just 60 seconds. It's less than two weeks before you can cast your vote for the 2012 presidential election. UNC Student Senate presents a Rock the Vote campaign event to educate college voters. The Rock the Vote campaign bus traveled from Texas to the UC parking lot to inform students to vote. With music, free samples, and prizes, students came to the event to have fun. Students had the opportunity to win prizes and fight dancing. The prizes included t-shirts, UNC gear, and gift cards. Students also had the chance to try different Mio water enhancements and a new yogurt drink. At the yogurt stand, free sunglasses were up for grabs. The popular place for students was under the Assassin's Creed 3 tent. Students were able to test run a free trial for the game after, game, after they received a free Assassin's Creed 3 t-shirt. Students were informed about the presidential campaign while having fun. The presidential debates aren't the only thing worth watching lately. In the spirit of Halloween, residence halls on campus are throwing watch parties for several scary movies. This week's theme was a paranormal activity marathon, and you may have heard the screams across campus. Bear News reporter Cordray Bordabrigi has the scoop on the paranormal productions. No relatives. I don't know. I've never met his mom. Front door open. Mom? Thanks, Cordray. <laughs> On the topic of paranormal activity, Bear News movie reviewer Jen Gamorano tells us if the latest paranormal movie is better than the first three. Jen, was Paranormal Activity 4 real good? Well, Jamie, with Halloween just around the corner, it's the perfect time to cuddle up with someone special and watch a scary movie in theaters. But Paranormal Activity 4 might not be the best choice. In a new twist to the series, the plot line picks up after the second movie with Kate and Robbie. After an unknown incident lands Kate in the hospital, Robbie stays with the family across the street when strange things begin to occur to the family. Robbie acts, an acts strange and has a habit of wandering out of, out of bed at night, talking to someone viewers can't see. Using laptops instead of security cameras, the daughter and her friend watch Ben and the strange occurrences that are surrounding them. The movie has many moments where the makers are obviously just attempting to startle the audience. There is little explanation of the details to the plot that has no resolution. And even for fans of the series, some have questions but no answers. For fans of the series, there is a chance this, will, this movie will disappoint. 
at the end of the credits. A cliffhanger hints at a fifth film, but let's keep our fingers crossed that that doesn't happen. Sounds exciting, Jen. It's kids and candy in the UC parking lot this Halloween. The UNC Residential Hall Association wants faculty, staff, and students to join in the safe trunk or treat this year. It's on Halloween, of course, from 4 to 8 p.m. in Lot C, south of the University Center. The RHA wants you to bring your vehicle to the lot, decorate them, and give out candy. Now, if you want to be even more creative, you can set up a game or activity. If you don't have a vehicle, come anyway, and you can decorate a table. If you can't get, if you can, you can get more information from Katie Steele at 351-2741. Well, Paul, it's been pretty cold the last couple of days. Is it going to stay that way? Well, Megan, it's going to snow again, actually, tonight. Um, we're expecting it to pick up again in the next couple hours, but I'll let you know exactly when after the break. Welcome back to Bear News. The UNC football team has yet to win a game against a Big Sky team, but they host the Idaho State Bengals, who'd come to Nottingham Field with the same record. Will the Bengals prove to be the team the Bears can beat? Let's catch the film. The Bengals are in scoring position first, but cannot get the ball between the posts. Seth Lobato connects with Jace Davis on this 26-yarder, and it is only uphill from there. Defense has a huge game with two fumble recoveries, including this one, where Idaho State's Kevin Yost loses the ball on the sack and Gavin Miller on the recovery. Seth Lobato with the ball, steps back and passes straight to Dominic Gunn to the end zone, ending the half with a score of 28 Bears, 7 Bengals. Into the second half now, Bears keep rolling on through the Seth Lobato with this connection with Doug Steele for 80 yards, enlarging the gap to 28 points, and the Bears keep spreading it on thick with this interception by Timmy Niwayu, who with the first with his first career, a uh, big big man of the game, Tremaine De Dennis, excuse me, breaking tackles and rushing big, breaking the UNC Division I rushing record with 178 rushing yards. Bengals are not completely done for, a scoring a second TD the game right here, but it was way a little bit too late. The Bears would win with 52-14 final score. The Bears host the Northern Arizona Lumberjacks on Saturday. To wrap up their season, the soccer team took one last road trip, but it couldn't have got any worse. The Bears would, f excuse me, the Bears fell 2-0 to Idaho State last Thursday. The scoreless tie wasn't broken until the 57th minute when the Bengals' Alyssa Kenny slipped the pass through Natalie Diadamio. Ten minutes later, Kate Flynn adds an insurance goal and that'd be the final in Pocatello. After that loss, the Bears shoot down Interstate 15 to Ogden to take on Weber State. Fighting for their playoff lives, it was a win or go home situation for the Bears. But a Chansey Crompton goal 27 minutes in made it one nothing. Laura Valens got the equalizer for her first goal of her career, but the Bears couldn't overcome the Wildcats because of the tiebreaker scenarios. It, they miss out on the Big Sky Tournament just one year after hosting. A bit of good news for the soccer team though, senior midfielder Daniel Birdsell and senior goalkeeper Natalie Diadamio, who's been hot this season, will return next year. Birdsell received a medical red shirt from the NCAA uh, due to a leg injury suffered in the season opener, and Diadamio will be granted a fifth year of eligibility. Good news for the Bears. And the volleyball team also stumbled on their most recent road trip. To start off the trip, the team took on Montana State and Bozeman, and it was all UNC all night long. Kelly Arnold was definitely Kelly Arnold in that game. She scored, she, excuse me, she recorded 15 kills and 16 digs. Andrea Spostat, the sophomore sensation, had six blocks, and UNC had a 254 hitting percentage and five aces. They took that momentum into a matchup against Montana in Missoula, and that could, that could not have gone smoother. Arnold had 17 kills and Meredith Johnson added 19 digs, but a 349 hitting percentage from the Grizz helped them to three sets to one victory. So now that you're caught up on all the Bears news we're going so far, let's go take a look ahead. The football team gets a second straight game home, this time against Northern Arizona. Good news, they finally have momentum going into this game. Bad news, eh, they need a pretty good momentum beating NAU. NAU is 13th ranked in the country. The volleyball team returns to Butler to face Weber State tonight at 7 p.m. and then will face Idaho State at Butler at 7 on Saturday. Soccer team has one more shot at the W tomorrow against nationally ranked Kansas. That game starts at 3. It's still a week and a half off, but you know we're excited for some basketball teams to get going on here. The men open up with an exhibition game against UCCS on November 6th, that game at 7 at Butler, and the women get going on their schedule on the 2nd with the exhibition date with Regis. The games tip off at 7 p.m. 
And before we leave you tonight, ever wondered how the athletics department gets money for their scholarships they hand out? Well, how about the reverse raffle? That's where that comes into play. The annual event held okay, this year everybody. at Butler Hancock gave alumni forever player, former players and the Greeley community a chance to bump shoulders with current UNC athletes. The event was co-hosted by former sports information director and current football PA man Tom Barber and basketball's Tim Huskison. There was a talent show, raffle drawing, and silent auction. What a fun way to get different sports up into the athletics program, and it's so great to see the community giving back to the university. Well, I wish I had gone to that event. I wish I knew about it. It looks like fun. <laughs> that looked really exciting, actually. Um, after the break, we'll show you a yummy and easy way to make some tacos. Stick around, and we'll be right back. Dinner time is approaching fast. For those of you who need help deciding what you would like to eat, maybe we can help. Fair News reporter Megan Pressler will show us how to satisfy that Mexican food craving. You love burritos, armadillo, three margaritas, but sick of having to pay the price for it? Well, we have a meal you can cook at home for half the price. It's a taco casserole, and you can whip it up in just a couple of minutes. For this quick and easy Mexican dish, what you will need, you'll need a crescent roll, You'll need ground beef and taco seasoning to mix it together. You'll also need sour cream and shredded cheese. We chose a Mexican shredded cheese, but you can choose anything you'd like. And then we chose lettuce and tomatoes to top it off with. Anything else you would like with your tacos is um, very good as well. And it is delicious served with Doritos on the side. The first step in this taco casserole will be to cook your ground beef. You'll also add your taco seasoning when the beef is completely cooked, and then we'll soon add it to our other ingredients. Once you have your beef cooked, make sure your oven is up to 350 so we can put this in the oven when we're done with it. Make sure you have sprayed butter on your pan so the crescent rolls won't stick on this when we cook it. Once you have your dough in your pan, pat it down and make sure it's even and up onto the sides. It'll become our crust. When you have finished with your dough and patting it down, now we will add the beef. Lay the beef evenly on top of your dough, and now it is time to layer it with sour cream. You will use about approximately a cup of sour cream, else you could just top it off and layer it evenly on top. Once you have an even coat of sour cream, it's time for the cheese. You'll use about a one and a half cups of cheese, else just put on as much as you want. When we have the dough, the beef, the sour cream, and the cheese, it is time to put it in the oven. It'll be at a 350 degree temperature, and we'll put it in for 20 minutes. Dinner is ready. We'll take it out of the oven here. Mmm. And you can top it off with your lettuce or tomatoes or any other toppings you may like, and it's ready for dinner. Thanks, Megan. That actually looks really good. Did you it was. I hope <laughs> you was brought it? us some. Yeah, I have some at home, I think. <laughs> oh, good. I'm coming over. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this evening. Stay tuned for the pre-election sneak peek coming up soon. Bye.